We're continuing our series today. Uh, the t title of it is, What's in it for me? What's in it for me? And I was looking at the generations, uh, my generation, the boomers, they asked that question, what's in it for me? But most of the time, uh, they did it incognito. So it was kind of, you know, beating around the bush or working out on the edges, trying to figure out, what am I going to get out of this, this life that I'm living with Jesus? And uh, I've discovered that the current generation, the millennials, they're just overt with it. They just simply come right out and say, what do I get out of this? You know, how many weeks vacation do I get from this job? And how much are you going to pay me? And what am I going to be able to put in my 401k, which I think is pretty, pretty smart. I'm not saying that one group is better than the other, or one's right and the other one's wrong. It's just that's, that's something that's in us. This series has been so inspiring for me personally because it's given us the opportunity to look at the core value within us, something that I believe God put inside us. He wants us, Hebrews 11, 6 says, that with, without this thing called faith, without this absolute assurance in our heart that God is and that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him, we don't find our way. It's when we accept the fact that Jesus is our Savior. Thank you so much. He's our Savior, the Lord of our life, and loves us more than we could, could begin to imagine. We start to, we start to see things the way that he wants us to see them, and that is that we are the center. I think I've said this to you before. Every single person here is a priority with God. Would you just do me a favor and touch your neighbor and tell them you're God's favorite? Would you do that? Tell them you're God's favorite. I mean, that just sounds good, doesn't it? All three of my kids have lived their life trying to figure out. In fact, they've accused the other one, well, you're daddy's favorite or you're mom's favorite. We, it's, it's just something that's in us. But the beautiful thing about the children of God, and John says that is what we are. We're children. We're his favorite, his absolute favorite. I read this great story this week in preparation for our sermon today about a young lady who had gone off to college, fell in love, and became engaged before she had ever introduced him to her parents. And so she's bringing him home. It's the, it's the big reveal. <laughs> she gets there, and they, you know, the, the mom and the dad, they're just real nervous, and they're, they're looking at him like, I'm not so sure about this one. And so anyway, after dinner, the wife says to the husband, sweetie, why don't you have a conversation with him? See if you can find out something about him. So the dad invites him to come into the study, and they're there. And he says, so, um, so what's, your, what's your plan? He says, oh, well, I'm a, I'm a student. You know, I'm in seminary, and I'm studying the Bible, and, and I, I'm just going to focus on my studies. He says, well, how are you going to buy a nice home for my daughter? You know, one like she deserves. He said, well, to be honest with you, sir, I'm just going to really focus and try to keep my GPA up. I want to do a really good job as a student, and I believe God will provide. The dad says, okay, but, you know, a job, a career, what are you thinking? How are you going to be able to buy a, a nice engagement ring for my daughter? He said, well, again, sir, you know, I'm really focused on my studies. I'm trying to be a great student. And I really believe that God will provide. And the dad's getting nervous. He says, well, what about children? You know, when children come along, they're, they're kind of expensive. And uh, a car, do you have your own car? Oh, 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 no, sir. He said, I've been enjoying driving this wonderful car that you provided for your daughter. It's just been great. <laughs> it's been great. We, we go out. We just have a wonderful time. And... Uh, so after dinner, the, the husband and the wife, they get together, and she says, so, so what do you think? He said, oh, it's worse than we thought. <laughs> he doesn't have a job. He has no plan. And worst of all, he thinks I'm God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, this is the truth. 
Will God provide? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so the dream that he's put in our heart, because we are in this place called the United States of America. Listen, anything is possible. Seriously, anything. The gentleman I shared with you at the offering, Letourneau, left, left school so early. Most people would have thought, his, his mom and dad, they must be crazy letting him out of school like this. But he had this dream in his heart. He knew that God was doing something inside him, and so he left Vermont where he was born and moved to Minnesota. There had a, an experience that aided him and helped him in his walk and in his journey. Made it to San Francisco, California, just before the great earthquake and the incredible fire that took place. And so he gets there, and it's like all the jobs have just dried up. What am I going to do now? And so he finds a way to begin to study machinery and mechanics. And before you know it, he's on his path and on his way. Finally goes to Texas where he meets his wonderful bride. And of course, as they say, the rest is history. He was born November 30th, 1888. And he went home to be with Jesus after a long and a fruitful life at 81 on June the 1st. 1969. Anytime that you ride by from now on and you see one of those great big yellow earth movers, you will remember this story about R.G. Letourneau, a man who discovered that God was for him, a man that didn't have the credentials that a lot of other successful people had, but he had God in him. And because God was for him, it was tough for the enemy to keep him down. I mean, an earthquake and a fire didn't get him. And so you're here today, and our sincere prayer this morning is for God to touch you. We're unashamed about that, that prayer, and that sincere request that if you don't know Jesus, that something will have already happened, or something will be said between now and the time that we have our prayer and then head next door to enjoy food, that God would touch your heart, that he would break through. You see, those of us who are born again remember how it was before we were born again. And there was this, this shroud of darkness that was all around us. And God came into that darkness and made Jesus so attractive we wanted him. And we de decided to say yes to his claim on our life. We may have asked at that time, what's in it for me? So here's the beautiful thing. God heard Simon Peter ask that question. It wasn't these words, but it was very similar. And so Jesus decided that he would answer that question. What's in it for me? And so we just want to take a moment and share that with you. What's in it for me? If you can uh, look at the scripture on the screen, then Peter began to say to him, See, we've left all and followed you. In other words, Simon Peter is saying, Lord, you know, we've given up all this stuff. What's going to happen? What's, what's in it for me? So Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there's no one who has left house, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake, and the gospels who shall, there we go, who shall not receive a hundredfold now, look at that, in this time, houses and brothers and sisters, mothers, children and lands with persecutions. He didn't hide anything. He knows that this life as a believer, as you saw the demonstration by these children this morning, requires sacrifice. He didn't hide that. But listen, I don't care what kind of sacrifice you have to give today. Does it matter what you have to walk away from to experience Jesus? Everything in this life, come on, children of God, everything in this life pales in comparison to Jesus. And this is why the Hebrew writer says in chapter 12, since we are compassed about, meaning that since there's so many saints, so many believers that have gone on before us, let us lay aside every weight, so whatever it is, and sin that so easily besets us, and let us run with patience the race that has been marked out for us. Listen to this, looking unto Jesus. So this morning, if you're in the midst of a trial or a test 
or some type of addiction or situation, a breakup of a relationship, get your eyes fixed on Jesus. And I assure you, it will look better. It will look better. And so Jesus says, with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Now, we spent a good bit of time talking about that a couple of weeks ago, verse 31. And so this morning, I just want to share with you that God is on your side. Here's a better uh, description of that. You're on his side. Now, I've been on some teams before that weren't very good. Anybody? I, yeah, I mean, we're just dreading every game because, you know, we're, we're, we're not very good. But listen, that's not the team you're on. That's the team you used to be on. Now you're on the winning team. You're on team Jesus. And on his team, listen, we always win. It may not look like it. There may be times that it, it looks like the, the columns have been added up and we came up short, but not with him. Because just one with the Lord is a majority. Can you say amen? amen. So we are on his team. And this morning, there are just three simple things I want to share with you. That we are living a life of freedom. Freedom. Jesus Christ died in our place. He did for us what we could not do for ourselves. He lived a perfect life. He died in our place. And in that act of sacrifice and surrender, he redeemed us. He paid the penalty. He paid what it cost for us to be right with God. And so in this, this act of salvation, here's what happened. We were justified. That's what salvation is. Salvation means just as if we had never sinned. And so he set us, not just apart, but set us above and then he blessed us with the power of his Holy Spirit. And when he comes in, when Jesus comes in, that very first moment that he comes in, he brings with him something that R.G. Letourneau would tell us. I didn't know how to do this. He has more than 300 patents. More than 300. A kid without any formal training, any formal education, where did that come from? You say, oh, that was just a fluke. No, no, no. No. <laughs> We're going to spend the uh, second half of this year looking at Christian businesses. Individuals who put their hand in his hand and become a part of his team. And those that have done that, things have soared for them. It's unmistakably clear that when we put our life in his hand, we are blessed and highly favored. You can say that with me. I am blessed and highly favored. Yes, the favor of God is on us. And here's what I've noticed. Because I, trust me, not the smartest, not the brightest bulb on the tree, not the sharpest knife in the drawer. But there are people today that like me, they have no idea why they do. I mean, they just, they like me. What is it? It's favor. There are people that like you today. They have no idea why they like you. Why do I like this lady? Or why do I like this guy? It's, it's the favor. God's favor is on us. And so he gave Letourneau this incredible wisdom. Everybody say wisdom with me. Wisdom. We're going to talk a lot this morning because the kids are with us today. And so we don't want them to get sidetracked or distracted. And so it helps if they'll talk back to us. So say wisdom with me real loud. Yeah. So here's what God does. He gives us wisdom. I mean, he just heaps it on us. And here's what David said in Psalm 51, verse 6, that God wants us to be pure in the inner part, in, in, in the heart. And listen, and he gives us wisdom in the secret place or the hidden place, the King James Version says. When he comes in, he brings this amazing wisdom. 
So we look back into the Old Testament and we see those, those times when the tabernacle was being erected. And then when Solomon was building the temple that David had in his heart to build. And the Bible says that God gave these, these craftsmen the supernatural ability to do all the things that he had instructed Solomon to do. Now, you're sitting here this morning, and the God of this universe, the creator of all humankind, is with you, and he is in you. Listen, he has an amazing purpose and a plan, a specific plan for your life, and he's going to bring that to pass by the spiritual gifts that he puts in your life, he wired you a particular way. When you came out of the womb, you had a particular bent and then a secondary for your personality temperament. And then inside you, he's given you these awesome desires and dreams, these passions, I call them. And when we begin to look at that, listen, you ever, you ever been praying and you just, you just, it was just so obvious. I have this, this longing or this desire, you could call it passion. For this to happen, anybody with me? You ever had that happen? You're praying and you just, you just have this overwhelming sense that I want to see this happen, Lord. Or I want this to happen for this person. Where do you think that comes from? It comes from him. He has put that in you. Now, last week I told you that if you have this, this sense or this sensation or this thought to give someone $1,000, that's probably not coming from your flesh. And it's definitely not coming from the enemy. And so that passion, that desire, that dream that you have in your heart, that is, that is hopefully it's driving you to your knees. And there on our knees, we begin to cry out to God. He does that so that we will pray, so that he will answer it, and we will know that he's the one that's brought it to pass. Hallelujah. And so here's the thing that he does. He gives us wisdom. Wisdom. Incredible wisdom. He is in you. And there, right there, Proverbs chapter 2 says that it's the beginning. It's the beginning. Wisdom and the fear of the Lord is the beginning. It's where it all starts. When he comes, he brings with him all this awesome wisdom. This knowledge, Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 9 says it again. It talks about this gift that God gives to us, this deposit that he puts inside us. Wisdom. I hate to keep harping about what happened to me when I was converted, but there was such a miraculous transformation from there. And so it was like, it was like a dumb rock and something happened to it, and it became animated and could walk around and talk and hear and listen, all these things. It was that kind. That's what happens. You see, we are dead, the Bible says, in trespasses and sins. We're just alienated from God, separated from him. But when you step across the line of faith and you decide, yes, I want Jesus in my life, all of a sudden, something supernatural happens. We become aware. It's like, we're breathing. I love the story about the, the uh, caterpillar. Kids, you know what happens to a caterpillar? What does it become? That's right. And so, I mean, think about this. Here you got this little caterpillar, and he's limited. So limited in where he lives. And this is the way it is before we come to faith in Christ. We're so limited. Now, you could have all kinds of talents and abilities, but truthfully, until you get Jesus inside you, you are limited, just like the caterpillar, who is limited and confined to a certain area, just crawling around and eating, chewing on green things. And then, what happens? It goes into a cocoon, that's right. It goes into this, this place. Would, as believers, we would say that represents... Galatians 2 and 20, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. And so in that cocoon, in that place that represents the grave, something happens. Now, just think about this butterfly. Here it is. Inside this little creepy crawly thing, it's not very pretty, is it? 
Now, I wasn't very pretty before I came to Jesus. And so crawling around, eating leaves, and then in this cocoon, the metamorphosis begins to occur. And can you just see this, this, this little caterpillar starting to wake up? And it's, now it's free, and it's moving, and all of a sudden, it's like, shut up. <laughs> wow. Wow. I feel like that. Oftentimes, I feel like that. Yeah, God is so real. He is so awesome. And if you don't know him, you're going to be so excited today when we give you the opportunity to pray a simple prayer and receive him. Because what happens next is knowledge. This information that God begins to, I know the, the, the new terms is to download. God just begins to download stuff in our mainframe. It's, it's this new spirit that he's given us. It's this supernatural flow of God. It's called the Holy Spirit. He begins to move through us and woo us and draw us and put this information inside us. And then finally, it's faith. Faith. Without it, you can't please God. Without faith, the Bible says it is impossible. But here's the beauty of it. I love Romans 12, 3. Because right there, it became crystal clear to me that I had no way of finding God. I've heard people say that, and I know they're well-intentioned. I'm not condemning anybody for making that statement that I found God. The truth is, he found you. Those of us that are believers, he found us. He came right to where we were, walked right into our mess, discovered us. Were we lost from him? No. No, not to him. He knew right where we were. But just like with Adam when he came in the garden and he said, where are you? He wants us to know, you're lost. You ever been lost? Somewhere where, where you, you just looked around and nothing familiar, like scratching your head saying, where in the world am I? That's the way it is prior to Jesus coming in with the wisdom that he gives us and the knowledge that he provides for us, showing us how to walk, how to live, how to experience his life. And it all begins with something called faith. Romans 12, 3, the Bible says that God's given to every person, every individual, the ability to believe. Touch your neighbor and say, that's awesome. Now, why is that so awesome? Jesus told us, because it doesn't take a lot of faith. So don't beat yourself up. If you have doubts, if you came out of the womb as a pessimist or a skeptic, don't, don't beat yourself up. It doesn't take a great deal of faith. Should we be growing our faith? We know we should. Yeah. And how does faith come? Through hearing and the word of God. So yes, praying with an open Bible. Yes, those things are important. But here's the thing. Does it take a lot of faith? It doesn't. Jesus said, if, he, I can see him laughing when he says this. Guys, if you have faith like a mustard seed, they knew how small a mustard seed was. Now, most of us don't, do we? They're so small, you can hardly see them. If you have faith like a mustard seed, you could speak to a mountain and command it to go. Listen, it's going to obey you. That little bit of faith. And why is that? Here's the conclusion as the musicians come this morning. Why is that? Why does it require such a little bit of faith? Because everything, listen to me, Everything God does, he does because he loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves me. Oh, God, he loves me. Oh, how he loves me. How awesome that is today. That revelation alone is enough for us to say, I want to be on your team, Jesus. That information alone warrants my total surrender, my willingness to walk away from whatever it was back there. However wonderful I thought it was, or however horrible it might have been, knowing that Jesus loves me, it's the 
golden text of the Bible, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, you can say it with me, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 17 says, God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Oh, listen, he loves you this morning. He does. He gave his life just for you, just for you. And when he comes in, he brings amazing wisdom. We could say it like this. He brings success. He never loses. He's never lost a battle yet. He's never lost a single one of his children. Not a one. He said, I know my sheep. John 10, he says, they hear my voice. John 17, he told us, of all that the Father had given to him, none had slipped through his fingers except for the son of perdition. So I want you to bow your heads with me right where you are this morning. I want you to open your heart to him. The Holy Spirit. Thank you so much for tuning in to our video presentation of the gospel. We believe that God is able to touch you where you are. And at the conclusion of our service at church, we always give an opportunity for people to accept Christ. And today, on this video presentation, we want to give you the opportunity. We've asked God to touch people's hearts and to have those that don't know Him to view this material and that the Holy Spirit would touch you right now. You may say, Steve, I don't understand all there is to know about this Christianity stuff. You don't have to. We're not asking you to join the church or do anything religious. We're asking you today to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And here's how simple it is. All you have to do is, A, admit that you're not perfect. There's not a one of us perfect. We've all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God. B, believe what the Bible says about Jesus is true because it is true. And those who believe, listen, have everlasting life, John 6, 47. And then C, confess. If you confess with your mouth, Romans 10, verse 9 and 10, and believe in your heart, God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. And I'll lead you in a prayer. And together, we can tell God what you're sensing in your heart right now. So you may want to bow your head and close your eyes, or you can keep your eyes open. Just simply say this prayer with me. Repeat this after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I ask you today, to forgive me of every sin. And though I can't name them all, I am truly sorry. I ask you to save me. I invite you to come into my life and change me. From this day forward, I'll never be the same. Now, I pray, Lord, that you would fulfill your divine purpose for my life. Help me to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, based on the authority of the Word of God, if you prayed that prayer sincerely in your heart, you are born again. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says the old is gone and the new has come. There are three things that need to happen now. Number one, you need to tell somebody. My email address is on the screen, steve.brown at westmetrocog.org. Send me an email and tell me today that you made this decision for Christ. And what we'll do is we're going to email you some free material. It's an ebook that will start you in your brand new journey with God. If today you're rededicating your life, you need to get back in the Word of God. Let us send you this book. Let us reach out to you and help you. You won't get any requests for money. Everything that we send you is going to be absolutely free. Freely we've received, freely we're going to give. So give us the opportunity. Number two, be baptized in water. If you're near our church in Douglasville, of course, we want you to be baptized in water at our church. But if not, we'll help you find a church in your area where you can connect with a group of people in a life-giving church, and we'll help you get baptized in water. And then number three, you need to become a part of a life-giving church. And again, if you're in Douglasville, there's not a greater church in all the world than the West Metro Church. We'd love to have you right here. But if not, we'll help you connect with a church that is near you. Thank you so much 
for tuning in. Thank you for praying this prayer with us today. We want you to know we love you. Most of all, God loves you. Bless you.